So they, they did it fast, they did it good, and it was a, uh, an incredible thing to behold and watch. Next slide, please. With that, this is how the lake looks now. You can see that, go back please. I wanna talk about the dam a little bit. You can see the spillway off to the left there. You can see that there's a whole new face to the dam. If you remember the dam prior, it was an earthen dam. This is all riprap rock. And this dam has been used, or this lake has been used, I should say, tremendously during COVID-19. I've counted 35, 40 cars every day up there. So it's a blessing to a lot of the people who are stuck in their homes because they have to be. Next slide, please. This is Officer K from the Butler Conservation Office. He's our uh, officer here. He's throwing in trout that were stock, uh, was stocked at the lake early spring before the grand opening, opening in April 15th of 2017. Uh, there are a lot more people than the people you see there, but this was the first official stocking where people were invited to participate. Next shot, please. This is my lovely wife, Linda, who I thought I would put in there for everybody to see. She's inspecting our work. This is an ADA compliant deck with marine grade decking and special aluminum railing for people that can be wheeled right up drop a line into 10 feet of water. This is one of our $120,000 projects that we did. Another one was the excavation into the eastern end of the lake, the shallow end. And I'm sure Dave Fowler will talk a little bit more about that. Next slide, please. This is an overview of the lake. As you can see, the lake is in blue. The surrounding property is in orange. And this is the watershed that we are attempting to secure property, either through purchasing, through agricultural preservation, or through conservation easements. If you notice all the blue lines that are going in, there's four major streams that go into the lake. And with that, we need to protect that and preserve that. So we came up with this plan that if we can purchase adjacent property, one being to the very north of the straight line that goes across, it's a former light airport for uh, light aircraft, I should say. We're looking at that as an addition. It's about 125 acres, almost would almost double the uh, size of the lake. And we are looking to get agricultural preservation easements and conservation easements for people that own streams that lead into the lake. It's the only way that we're gonna protect this lake. It's a, it's a big project. We need a lot of support and help. And with that, I think my time's up. I want to thank you all again for participating. And we have a wonderful crew of people and I want to thank my board specifically because like I said, these people have been here since 2011, most of them, and the other people that jumped on after that have just been phenomenal. Everybody should give them a shake. Thank you very much. Thanks, Siggy. And one of our key uh partners in this enterprise is the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. Uh, Tim, are you there? Can you, you're um, the executive director of the commission. Can you tell us a bit about the way you partner with organizations like our Conservancy? Tim, are you there? Maybe as on, on mute. I'm not seeing Tim online now. Do you want to skip and go to the next person? I will indeed. So we seem to have temporarily lost Tim. So we'll move on to Roy. Uh, Roy Watzel, another member of our board uh, and a professor up at the Eden Hall campus of Chatham University. Roy, you were going to tell us a bit about the watershed and how we actually protect it, yeah? Sure. Uh, th thank you, Peter. Welcome, everybody. I run the aquaculture lab there. I'm an aquatic scientist by background uh, and landscape ecologist. And so what I'd like to 
talk to, uh, to you about today and, and what my specialty is really is the relationship between the landscape and the health and quality of aquatic resources. And uh, Peter, you can go ahead and skip to the slide, but um, you know, land cover, uh, whether it's natural or man-made, the way that we use the landscape, Uh, within the rivers and streams and lakes uh, to which uh, the water flows off the landscape. And so uh, go back. There's a little bit of a delay in uh, transition. So um, it's hard to, uh, for me to, to know where we are staying. Okay, uh, Siggy already showed this. This is the, the Glade Run Lake and watershed uh, in green. Uh, what is a watershed? Water that enters the landscape and any materials that's in that water will flow to a particular end point. And in our case, the end point is the lake. And so when we're thinking about how to protect uh, the lake itself, we have to look out to the larger watershed and all of the stream tributaries that flow into it. Um, on the map here, you see the lake in the middle. Oh, Roy? It's to, yes. Roy, okay. Excuse me for interrupting you. This is Rocco Ally. Tim Schaefer just texted me and said he could hear everyone very well, but um, it, he can't get unmuted. So if you could get, could you get that message to Peter by some chance? I got that, Rocco, and I'll bring him on. I'll bring you on, Tim, directly after Roy. Okay. I'm sure he can hear that, so he, he should know. Thank you. Sure. No problem. So getting back to the map here, you see the lake and is in orange. The entire watershed is in the green. Uh, it's about 3.3 miles, so not a very big watershed. that we need to be concerned with, uh, but it also means uh, that things are moving very quickly off the landscape into the lake itself. Um, the streams are in blue, um, and you can see in the yellow line on the north side of the lake is the trail system that's developed as it stands for now. The black uh, triangles are areas uh, in the watershed uh, where we are sampling uh, actively for different water quality parameters, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And it's going to take a couple seconds to transition, at least on my end, to think about. But there are areas within the watershed that are uh, really, really important to maintaining the water quality of the of tributary streams and the lake itself. And these are called riparian zones. This is the transition between the landscape into the water. Uh, and uh, ideally, uh, these would be maintained in some sort of natural cover uh, because there are a lot of valuable goods and services that both we as humans and especially the ecosystem uh, gets from these areas. They're transitional areas between water and land, so they're high in biodiversity. They're artificial runoff and even groundwater inputs uh, into the lake from the landscape. They absorb flood flows to helping to filter the water, provides critical uh, nutrients uh, to aquatic uh, ecosystems in the form of leaves, uh, woody debris, uh, which also serves as habitat and, and the basis of the aquatic food chain. So, um, what I'm going to focus on and what our monitoring focuses on uh, inputs largely uh, into the lake because these are the things that uh, are going to cause the major issues that we're concerned with. So what are we doing? Well, uh, we're in the beginning stages of developing uh, a program, uh, a more comprehensive program, uh, this has been going on for some time, as we'll see, uh, of monitoring changes in the landscape uh, uh, 
establishing the current uh, status of the landscape and, and where land use and land cover. Peter, I don't know what slide's showing for you all, but I'm still seeing the riparian slide. There we go. Probably my network. Uh, and so to get at some of these questions about this relationship between the landscape and the water, I've started to do a bit of land cover analysis. This is done in GIS and looking at what uh, is happening within our watershed and in, in terms of the different land cover types and how they're changing over time. Of course, we don't uh, know yet uh, how things will be changing in the future. Um, uh, right now, we're just trying to lay a baseline of where we stand. So in the top, again, you see the lake and its landscape. The watershed is in black there. The, the lower figure, base, uh, which is a, a classification of different types of land cover and land use uh, from satellite data. And you can see, I hope, in the diagram, the two diagrams that they roughly coincide with each other. Uh, you can see where the areas of development are, are red in the lower figure, uh, brown and, and yellow is agriculture and the different shades of green, uh, and blue are natural forests and natural wetlands. So we can put this data into a computer and look not only at what's going on watershed wide, but what's happening in these critical areas. We diagram that there's a pink lines that uh, mirror all of the streams and surround the lake. This is a 100. To get a, an idea of what's happening in the riparian zone. Um, so to the bottom right there are all the land cover types. You see the different colors and what they represent and percentages of each type of that type of land cover, both in the watershed and the riparian buffer. It's a lot to take in. Um, and so what I've done is to consolidate in the upper table there. You see I've got natural land cover, agriculture, developed land, which is uh, roads, uh, yards, and those types of things, and finally impervious cover. And what we see is that the majority of the watershed is still in two dominant alternative types of land use are agriculture and uh, just a little bit of developed land. Uh, that developed land is is not concrete and impervious. It's uh, to water flow, it's it's largely open of trying to go back uh, and um, try to recover some of those areas. Uh, going from lawn to a natural cover is less uh, is more doable than than going from say concrete or a parking lot to to a natural land cover. We look at the riparian zone real quick. The numbers are better. About so, almost 75% of the riparian is in natural cover, and that's a great thing. Pasture, and um, you know we hope to work with uh, folks uh, doing agriculture in the watershed to uh, into a natural cover, uh, so that we can get those benefits back. Very little impervious cover, concrete driveways and that kind of stuff, and that's a great thing. Um, we're nowhere near what we normally would be concerned about as far as the total amount of impervious and, and seeing uh, uh, those effects in the lake, but that can happen quite quickly with development and, and we want to be able to monitor that as we move forward. Next slide, Peter. This slide is just uh, again reminding you of, of the landscape. Those black dots are where we're collecting water quality. It's basically uh, at the base of every stream tributary that's entering the lake so that we know what's happening in each stream's watershed and then in the lake itself and even uh, looks like one spot just down from the spillway that we know how everything and then going down into the, to the river and stream down below. One thing I didn't explain before that diagram in the upper 
Mountain, the, the creek where the lake is part of, the headwaters down through as it flows down to the Gulf of Mexico. So if that in the lake is going, uh, you can trace that path on a map and understand that what we do uh, to the water quality and everything will eventually make its way all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Final slide, and I'll go through pretty quick because I feel like I've talked a lot. Um, as I said, the land cover and the use of the land exercises to keep track of the relative proportions of different land cover types, natural agriculture, and urbanization, which are the two dominant land use changes that are happening. It's not important not to know just that it's happening, but how much, not just how much, but where it's happening. Is it happening up? People developing in a way that preserves the natural function of these critical areas, or are they not? And if they aren't, then what can we do as an organization to encourage them and educate them and get them to do something that's a little bit more pres preservation minded. Uh, the water quality that we're monitoring right now uh, are directly related to the types of land use change that we see. A new tied to the amount of algae uh, and, and productivity in the lake, which can be a good thing to a point, but too much is, is a bad thing. An algae choked lake and also for the wildlife that lives there. Uh, dissolved oxygen, of course, uh, this is just being monitored in the lake, but this is a critical one for organisms. Uh, you got to be able to breathe to live. Uh, the amount of solids that are in the water, uh, the temperature of the water and the precipitation, these are things are all related to each other. During these over time, we'll have an idea both of where we stand now and being able to detect changes in the future. We've got about a year's worth describing the patterns that we're seeing, where they're happening, and then target our efforts in conservation. A couple other things that we'd like to monitor in the future, the conductivity and thinking about the use of salt on the landscape and the effects that that might have on water quality, and trying to get an idea of how much sediment is making it into the lake uh, during storm events and those types of things by monitoring the turbidity of the water. Uh, that's all I've got. Thanks very much, Roy. Sure. And uh, Tim, I gather you couldn't uh, get your mic working. I think it should be working now. So Tim. I think it is, yep. Great, so Tim. Can you hear me? Good. Yeah. Pennsylvania Fish and Boat uh, is one of the key partners on the lake. Could you tell us a bit about the work you do and how you partner with organizations like us? You bet, would be happy to. And, and Rocco Ally um, is our, um, uh, been a longtime friend of the, the project there. He lives locally in Armstrong County. We have a board of 10 commissioners statewide. Um, the Glade Run Lake is actually in our, our commissioner district from Northwestern Pennsylvania, so Dan Pastore, um, who's Rocco's counterpart to the, to the north, um, also has a connection to this project. So tell you a little bit about the agency. So um, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission is an independent administrative agency of the Commonwealth. We have about 56 dams that we manage on behalf of Pennsylvania statewide. And since 2008, we've worked on approaching 40 different projects like this to the tune of about $200 million. So um, we have a lot of old infrastructure that's needed to be fixed. And Glade, Glade Run was one of our early success stories. I um, want to echo the thanks uh, to the senators who were involved and to Siggy and the whole team for helping us to, to get to the point where we could have the money raised uh, to, fix, to fix the dam. So um, we own the property. We have a lease with the county to operate it like a park. Um, it's helpful to know that we are legally only allowed to use our money for fishing and boating purposes. It's in state and federal law. Um, we're a user funded agency by primarily fishing licenses and boat registrations. Um, so we aren't even allowed to use that money for park like amenities there, trails, et cetera, which is why it's so great to have a partner um, like the Conservancy um, to deal with. 
Um, so a little bit about um, our work there. You know, well, we, we did the contracting to rebuild the, the dam, which is, that could be a whole call on its own. Um, but we have staff who work on fish habitat. Um, for those of you that remember seeing some of the work that was done when the lake was drained and thereafter, um, Ben Page is the head of our lake management uh, section. And we've put about 150 structures into Glade Run Lake. It's important to note that Glade Run, like other man-made lakes, would just be a big bathtub if we didn't um, supplement the habitat that's there. So um, we've installed um, things like rock rubble humps, uh, catfish, channel catfish spawning boxes, uh, porcupine cribs, other types of structures, turtle basking platforms, and places for to provide refugia for fish and also spawning areas. Um, been really, really happy about that. Um, one of the things that we have yet to do, we'll be putting some more porcupine cribs in there, some additional spawning boxes, something that we'll likely do also. We've done other places, and it's good to give you a heads up ahead of time on this, is we'll, we'll strategically fell some trees along the shore. People think, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Well, you know, Deliberately dropping a tree down into one corner of the shore um, could, will provide terrific habitat. So I don't know exactly where that would take place, but just wanted to, you know, give you a heads up if citizens are over there thinking, "Oh my gosh, what's fishing boat doing chopping down a tree into the lake?" It's it would be done very selectively and with fish habitat in mind. Um, we don't have any projects planned for the lake um, in 2020 because of our inability to use volunteers. Um, but believe me, we'll, we'll be back out there doing habitat work. Um, so in addition to managing the habitat, we also manage the fishery. So um, someone mentioned about John Kay, our, our local WCO stocking trout. Um, Glade runs a very popular stocked trout fishery. Um, this year we stocked 6,300 rainbow trout in on March 17th. Because of COVID concerns, we accelerated our stocking schedule this year. We would have stocked multiple times in the year, but because frankly we were racing the virus and trying to get the fish out of our hatcheries as quickly as we could, um, we put all the fish in at once and actually provided a, a really record number of, of trout there for people to, to catch. The number didn't change, we just changed when we put them in this year and we'll be back out stocking more um, uh, trout in November of this year. Uh, but it is a warm water lake. Trout would not survive through the summer, given the, the, the temperature of the lake. It's a warm water lake, and so we've stocked it with largemouth bass, channel catfish, bluegill, white crappie, as well as forage fish. Think of minnows, shiners, uh, that we put in the lake to provide a, the, the basis of a food chain. Um, I was told that the largemouth, bluegills, and channel catfish are abundant. Uh, just need a little more time to grow, um, and once they do, the, the, the fishery will be even better. Uh, there were pumpkin seed sunfish that had been present in the stream that have also increased in abundancy as the lake refilled. Um, have a great partnership with Butler Junior High School where they have a cooperative nursery there and they're raising uh, channel catfish there and putting, they put several hundred fingerling, and when I say a fingerling of a fish, think of a fish the size of a finger. Um, they, they'll put uh, lots of those in every year and that's been a great way to supplement that fishery. Um, we will still have plans to stock more white crappies. We only started doing those in 2019, so that part of the fishery um, still has some time to come back on board. Uh, so we'll continue to do the habitat work. We'll continue to um, uh, do the maintenance that's required um, on the dam and on, on, the, on the access area, um, supplement the fishery. A um, couple of things I'm real excited about looking forward is um, the agency um, is stepping up our game on aquatic invasive species prevention. And one of the things that we've noted in our strategic plan is the need to install disinfection um, stations or cleaning stations so we're not spreading uh, invasive species from one water body to another. So um, that's something that could follow up with Siggy on um, if there would be any appetite perhaps to work with us on something there so people aren't, aren't unknowingly um, taking something you know from Glade Run or bringing something into Glade Run that we, we don't want to, want to uh, have there. Um, we're hiring an invasive species coordinator for the first time in the history of the agency, and we actually have interviews scheduled for that um, in about a week and a half. So real excited about that. Um, other thing just wanted to solidly put on everybody's radar screen is 
boating safety, um, with the explosion in kayaking, which has been tremendous. Um, we also see the need to remind people and educate a lot of people for the first time about the importance of boating safety. So um, uh, anything we can be doing with the conservancy to promote boater, the safety of the boaters as well as the, the health and safety of the, uh, of the lake, uh, we would love to look for chances to do that. Um, the last thing I'll say is that SIGI has my phone number um, as well as others in the agency. We are a phone call away. Um, I would say that, that Glade Run Lake Conservancy is one of the model partners that we've worked with. I know we've steered some other folks your way when they've had their lake drained and figured out, oh my gosh, what do I do next? And typically the first thing we say is call Siggy Payhill and see how they did it at Glade Run. So um, whether it's helping to, to facilitate the acquisition, potentially that airport property or anything else, um, you know, just give us a call. We've got local staff there at John Kay or WCO, um, but our statewide fisheries and habitat staff are just, just a phone call away to help anytime. Tim, that's great. Thanks very much. And it's so good to hear of a sort of public-private partnership that's working well, where we truly complement each other. And to be honest, with, without both organizations, we wouldn't have the lake we've got today. So that's a win in my book. Um, okay, guys, if we move on, uh, Becky Miller, another member of our board, is going to say a little bit about conservation easements. So this is getting back to what Roy was saying and Siggy about how do we actually protect the watershed and yet still have farmers able to farm and people able to use their land? So Becky, over to you. Hello everybody. I am the new vice president of the organization. I've been with the group since the beginning pretty much um, and previously worked a lot on fundraising and community uh, involvement and things like that. Um, when, uh, we, when it was announced that the funding for the dam uh, had been awarded, we were all ecstatic. We thought, yay, our work is done. Um, at that time, there was a large property bordering the lake that went up for sale. And I said, oh no, what if that gets sold to people that don't have the same values? And um, so it became pretty evident that we had another mission um, another form of stewardship that needed to happen for the lake um, once it did get restored. Um, and, uh, you know, in many cases, a lot of people will decide that um, selling to developers is the only thing that they can do to make money on their property um, or that they don't have other options. Um, and so we um, uh, basically would like to preserve this watershed and the lake for future generations so that they can enjoy it the way that we can enjoy it. Um, I believe uh, Allegheny Land Trust said if you're out in your kayak, what view do you want to see in 10 years and what view do you want your kids to be able to see when they're on this body of water looking at things from this vantage point. And that's what conservation is really about is preserving everything. Uh, so we explored some other ways that um, people could um, conserve their property or, um, or make some changes um, that potentially could have some tax advantages to them. Um, next slide, please. So um, there are basically four tools. There may be others that I'm not aware of yet. Um, that uh, can help us in, in these goals. Um, one is either purchase or outright donation of land. So an organization such as ours and or our partners would raise funds and, and buy the land and then deed it to a government agency um, that would, would use it as part of the preserve. Um, an owner could donate a land, uh, a, a plot of land that would border the lake or as part of the watershed. Um, zoning is another way that we can protect what can happen on land. I'm not really going to talk about that. Um, and then the two that we are starting to focus on are agricultural easements and conservation easements. Um, next slide, please. Um, so uh, an agricultural easement would be available for properties that are 50 acres or more. And there are two ways that those are granted. One is a competitive grant um, from the county and the, the county basically assesses farmland property for quality of soil and um, risk to the property and they rank them. 
and um, and then you're paid for the easement outright. Um, it uh, this is something that can take a long time to be accepted, and it is um, it is competitive. So you could be climbing up the list and then be bumped down again. The other way to do it is actually to donate an agricultural easement, um, in which case there may be some uh, tax advantages for doing that. Uh, and basically what you're doing is saying that this land won't be developed and you, um, you get a, an easement value for that. Um, and then there are some tax write-offs and things that you can do for that. Uh, the first step in being considered for an agricultural easement is to be part of an agricultural security area. And this is an application that's done for free through the township. Um, and the minimum for that, uh, that designation is 10 acres or $2,000 in sales per year from the property. And this basically protects farmers from overly burdensome regulations and provides some more um, protections against eminent domain. Um, but it is the first step in being considered. Um, and then conservation easements um, are a voluntary agreement between uh, Hey Pam, yeah, could I get your power cord just in case? Becky, can you hear us? You seem to have gone mute. Okay, guys, it looks like Becky may have lost her connection. Um, in which case, I'll move on to talk a bit about the ecology of the lake and how we protect that overall ecology. Uh, Dave, are you on the line? Dave Fowler. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? We can, Dave. So, the show's yours. Very good, very good indeed. Okay, um, I got to say that I was really excited to hear Tim's talk. And my talk is going to get just kind of down in the weeds a little bit from him. But we have had a wonderful partnership with the Fish and Boat Commission from Officer John Cadd, Ben uh, Page, Tim Wilson, who's our fish expert, these guys, Jerry Womer has been our engineer. These guys have been great, Tim. And um, hey, they all, they all ought to get raises as far as I'm concerned. And I would encourage any of the other lake folks out there, as Tim uh, talked about, because there's other lakes that are getting shut down, uh, to work with the fishing boat. Because for us, the, they've been tremendous. And so... Uh, just to get down to a little bit uh, for what uh, Tim said, is that uh, this has been a big partnership between the Glade Run Lake Conservancy and the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission. The Boy Scouts of America have been great. Susie will talk about that in a little bit. Uh, the Mars, Mars High School District, they're wonderful. They've helped us with uh, building habitat structures and also uh, the fish stocking that Tim's talking about. Uh, they might be able to really uh, grow us some good fat catfish out there after a little while. And uh, of course, all of our members and our sponsors, you know, we couldn't do this without the community. If the community wasn't behind this, then we couldn't get it done. And What's really neat about it is that the community realizes what we've got here and what we can do and save this for our babe, grandbabies in the future. Uh, next, please. Next slide. Okay. Um, this is a, a lot of what Tim was talking about. Um, he said that we had a partnership with uh, the Fish and Boat and Glade Run Lake Conservancy. And we put in to date about 150 plus uh, fish structures. And you'll have to forgive me. Um, 
today I'm going to be talking about the fish primarily, but we have put in bat boxes and uh, the walking trail and the bog bridges are key habitat protectors. And uh, we've also put in uh, the, the lots of other habitat structures other than fish, but let's talk about what we did for the fish. Um, there's a whole number of structures out there. You just saw one picture of one it was on a fish in uh, the boat and it was a, a porcupine crib. But uh, we put porcupine cribs, we put four short vertical plank structures, we put post structures, we put all kinds of different things. And we'll look at them just through here real quick. As you can see, uh, no, go back. Uh, as you can see, uh, the north on this map is uh, the top of the slide, and you can see the parking lot up there and the dam up in the upper left. What we've put is a whole series of fish structures within easy casting distance of the shore all along there, and you'll see that they're concentrated where the uh, jetty is to the upper left and uh, all along the shore there. And another thing we've done is we put a bunch of those uh, porcupine structures out in a big kind of artificial reef out in front of the dam in the upper left. And you gotta know these things have some serious fish uh, catching uh, potential here. It's also spawning beds, as you can see, the, the white ovals and uh, fish structures. And we'll also talk about the channel that we carved up that opens up that whole section of the lake to large scale game fish and why we did it. Next. This is a picture, you're kind of sitting over the dam looking up towards the jetty. And you can see the parking lot up to the upper left. And those are all the fish structures in there that Tim was talking about that we built. And we permitted all of this together. And um, we put in uh, 540 tons of limestone, bringing those, putting those structures in. And you've got rock rubble humps. You've got catfish spawning boxes. You've got rock stars, which are the th funky things kind of in the middle of the slide. And looking up along the jetty up there, you can see all the, the structures that we put up along the jetty. And that is just really good habitat for bait fish. And if there's habitat for bait fish, then there's going to be big fish floating around trying to eat them. You can also see the uh, spawning bed that we put up there. And right now, that thing is full of pumpkin seeds. Uh, if you go out there, Almost all of the shoreline along the north side now is taken up with uh, spawning sunfish. There's some nice ones out there and there's some nice bass. Next, please. Here's a picture looking at the jetty and uh, the picture that Siggy talked about. And that is uh, along the sides of the jetty, you can see all the structures there. And I'd like to talk just quick about the structure that looks like a, almost like part of a dock that's sitting out there by itself to the left side of the jetty. And that thing is going to make, it yield some huge fish. For fishermen out there, all of these post structures and all of this is set up so that you can cast right along the side of them and not get hung up. If you try to cast the wrong direction, good luck. Um, Next, please. Now, this is getting to into what t Tim was talking about. And you got the catfish spawning boxes up there. You got the post structures. We bought a hundred or a uh, hundred of those uh, posts up there to make all these structures. And the rock rubble humps. All of this provides excellent coverage and uh, forage for the bait fish that the big fish eat. And that's the reason why our bass are growing so fast. 
and the fishing university guys that came out here and fished for a living went out and looked at this and said in four or five years this is going to be a premier bass fishery next please okay here's a detail of the channel that we cut up into the uh on the northern side of the lake there we're looking east and we're about sitting over the boat ramp and you can see the island that we put in there and you can see all those kind of funny humps well all of that was put together because the channel has been dredged out to 10 foot deep and goes 1200 feet and it opens up the holy side of the lake over there on the north part to a, a, a quality fishery. That's where the, the big fish live. And from what I understand, there's uh, along the top of that channel up there um, in trout season, that's where they like to school up, right over on the eastern side over there. Now you can see the real shallow. This, this picture, the lake is only partly filled. And nowadays, of course, it's all full of water. But the shallow, the humps that you see in the middle of the uh, screen are only about two to six inches deep of water now. And we put those in there, they're called littoral areas. And that is a prime place for wading birds, for minnows. If you get out there early in the morning, the herons get out there. And uh, yeah. So, uh, About Glade Run Lake. Yeah, and um, so that was one of our major projects. We moved over 10,000 cubic yards of dirt doing that in partnership with the fishing boat, again, helping us design, uh, do all of this. Next, please. Oh, this is just a little as an aside. Um, it's a picture of uh, turtle basking platforms. Doesn't really have to do with fish, but we're sitting there on the boat of the fishing boat and they just roll these off. And uh, we put a whole number of those around the lake and I went out there this morning and by golly, there was a turtle on one. <laughs> so uh, next please. Ah, this is a, a something that is needs to be spoken to. Um, we hear a lot of questions about why did we leave the, all the trees and the brush in the lake? And that is, is because maybe the most important habitat improvement we make is leaving those in there and not cutting them out. I show you this because it shows not only the wonderful habitat for all our birds and other critters out there, um, but what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think about what that looks like underwater for the fish, right? And what you'd see is you'd see all the branches and the same structure and the moss, and instead of birds, those are all fish out there, folks. And uh, in partnership with the Boy Scouts and all of these folks, we can leave this to our grandbabies. And this will be one of the best fishing spots in the whole eastern coast here, eastern part of the states. Uh, next, please. Uh, Tim covered this pretty good. Uh, that's kind of what we put in there. The channel catfish and the largemouth bass are probably the uh, biggest things that people are concerned with. We put a lot of uh, trout in there, of course, and they're just temporary. We should catch them and eat them. But uh, there's tons of bluegills out there, and uh, we're still working on getting a good forage uh, population, which the rock rubble humps and all of this should uh, do. And so uh, people were excited about the white suckers because those are really good. It doesn't sound very good, but those were really good. Next, please. Okay, Dave, thanks very much for that presentation. And it ties in nicely with uh, what's coming next. Uh, so now we've got um, Bob Mulderhill from the National Aviary to talk about the birds that we see on the lake 
and what we're doing to try and conserve the bird populations. Uh, so Bob, it's over to you. Make sure your mic's switched on. Bob, are you there? There you go. There you go, Bob. Yep. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Well, just a, a quick point of uh, clarification. While, while uh, I, I am the ornithologist at the National Aviary, I am presently a furloughed ornithologist at the National Aviary. So, so my appearance here today is, uh, is as an independent bird lover uh, and, uh, and fan of the conservation work being done in connection with Clade Run Lake. Um, in any case, a Glade Run Lake, uh, as you can see just from the list of birds that have been seen collectively by all of the uh, of Western Pennsylvania birders who who have visited there uh, and entered their sightings in the uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's uh, database known as eBird. And what eBird does is actually a, a wonderful thing because it gives real scientific um, strength to the observations of citizen scientists. And so in the relatively short time that Glade Run Lake has been um, restored, um, we have uh, amassed uh, literally thousands of checklists um, and, uh, and those checklists combined have produced more than 163 uh, species of birds, uh, which is really uh, an extraordinarily good list for, for an area the size of Glade Run Lake. Um, it certainly is right up there with um, some of the larger um, areas you may be familiar with, like uh, Lake Arthur or or uh, even, even uh, Pima Tuning and, and Conneaut Marsh. And the reason that Glade Run Lake has proved to be so valuable for birds is because, frankly, it's a Fish Commission lake. And the Pennsylvania Fish Commission um, takes care of their habitats in a way that not only benefits the fish populations that, uh, that serve the fishers, that they are very concerned with and, and are their number one constituent, certainly. But because of the manner in which they, they maintain their lakes, they also provide some of the best bird habitat anywhere in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and so we really need to, to appreciate that fact that, um, that by supporting um, what fisher folks need, um, to pursue their hobby, we can at the same time improve overall habitat for wildlife and local water quality as well, not to mention recreational opportunities for, mul for, for every generation. Um, so this list is tremendous. And if you can click again, uh, Peter, um, this 163 species, and as I say, well, I'm sorry, I, I overstated. It's not thousands of checklists yet, but it's getting up there in the high hundreds and click, keep clicking. The next click is that we have, have on this list 25 species of water birds. Now these are ducks, geese, swans, and things like um, uh, gallinules and coots. So any of the floating water birds. We have five species of wading birds. These are the egrets and herons. And this includes two species, yellow-crowned and black-crowned night heron that are exceptionally rare in the state of Pennsylvania. Next. We have 11 species of shorebirds, gulls, and terns that have been observed already um, at the lake. Next. And uh, nine species of diurnal raptors, including bald eagle and osprey. And importantly, a lot of these species of birds are on Pennsylvania's list of species of conservation concern. Um, we have, uh, I think, five or six species we have to date now that are in that threatened, endangered, or vulnerable sort of category that have made Glade Run Lake uh, a place that they're, calling, uh, that they're calling home for at least part of the year. Um, next. 
Um, just going down through the little birds now, it's not just the lake is not just supporting the uh, charismatic uh, mega avifauna. It's also got the little dicky birds uh, that people like to see, six species of woodpeckers, click again, eight species of flycatchers. And in this uh, specific case, I want to mention that one of my first impressions uh, upon visiting Glade Run was that I had never seen more eastern kingbirds. I had never seen so high a nesting density of eastern kingbirds as I saw there. Next. Six species of swallows, including the the largest concentration of roosting swallows, again, that I personally had ever experienced. Next. And uh, the, the, the wood warblers are a group of brightly colored small songbirds that are mostly insectivorous that migrate to the neotropics. And they're considered to be, you know, sort of good ecological bellwethers because they fill so many ecological niches themselves. And because they're dependent on habitats both on the breeding grounds and on migration all the way to their Central and South American wintering grounds. A great many of, of different kinds of human activities can affect these species adversely. So the fact that the list uh, already shows 25 species of wood warblers, including one that is a wetland specialist, a prothonotary warbler, and is another species of special conservation concern in the state. Next. So uh, the person that uh, actually introduced me to Glade Run Lake is, uh, is, is Joe Lee, and uh, click next. And I wanna shine a light on Joe Lee. He's a good guy who is possibly your best ambassador uh, for, the, for the project, for Glade Run Lake, because Joe talks about it in glowing terms all the time to everybody. Uh, I've seen this personally and, and he doesn't, and he's persistent, but not in, a, not in an obnoxious way. He, he wants to get you out on the lake and by golly, he gets you out on the lake. And I am ever so thankful that he did because Joe has given me some experiences that I will never forget. Uh, and it's J Joe in combination with this very special place that all of you have created through your, through your combined efforts. Um, next. Um, Joe had, uh, had sent me, um, piqued my interest when he sent me a picture of this bird that he had spotted. And, 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 and I thank Joe for his uh, sharing so many experiences with me by being more than happy to, to identify uh, birds that he, he sends me pictures and, and videos and, and audio clips of things. And I'm more than happy to, 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 uh, to try to identify them. Well, I was a little bit surprised pleasantly uh, when he sent me this picture and I said, Joe, that's a yellow crown night heron. And they're extraordinarily rare. Next. And on one of our trips to the lake, you know, we're seeing so many birds, including this great egret that flew in and didn't just fly over, it stopped on the lake and, and roosted up in one of the trees there. Next. And of course, when we went looking uh, for the yellow crown night heron, uh, a follow up on the yellow crown night heron, um, we found that there were, in addition to, to that bird, two black juvenile, sub-adult or juvenile black crown night herons, um, spending a lot of time um, feeding and, uh, and, and moving throughout the habitats at Glade Run Lake. And even to the point that there seemed to be a possibility of, of, uh, of some nesting by the species, which would be extraordinary. This is a, an endangered species in Pennsylvania. It's limited to only two or three nesting locations uh, of significance. And those are in Eastern Pennsylvania out by uh, Harrisburg. Uh, so if, by, if we're lucky enough to attract some breeding uh, members of this species to, uh, to Glade Run Lake, that would be a phenomenal conservation success. Next. Um, the, uh, often when Joe invites me to go on the lake, it's either early in the morning, naturally, we're looking for birds, or in the evening. Uh, and in the evening, uh, if you hit it right as we did on, on this occasion, um, the swallows are taking advantage of the lake um, because, of course, the lake uh, is a habitat for many aquatic insects, 
which have, of course, a, a winged adult stage, and often there's a hatch coming off the water, and the swallows will uh, swoop around, and, and they feed aerially. So that's what they're doing. But not only that, um, they're also taking advantage of the flooded shrubs uh, that provide them with a very safe overnight roosting location. So on, on one particular night, we were literally awestruck by the number of swallows, probably about five to 10,000 swallows um, and um, at least five species represented. Uh, and it was just, a, just a, a magical experience. But more than being a magical experience, it's so important to these birds to have safe places to roost, rest, and feed. Next. And here's an interesting uh, way to think about this. Glade Run Lake, where it sits, uh, is serendipitously um, really important. I know what we're talking about uh, the watershed, and certainly Glade Run Lake is, sits within a watershed and it's affected by everything happening in terms of land, land use uh, within that watershed. But on this landscape scale, when you pull back and you look at where Glade Run Lake sits on the landscape, it is in fact right along a major migration flyway, a known one, for water birds moving from staging areas on Lake Erie to ultimate wintering destinations on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and okay. probably, especially in times when the weather is potentially not great, um, you're, you're gonna see some really huge fallouts of birds uh, potentially on Glade Run Lake. And they will be very lucky that Glade Run Lake is there um, providing the habitat that it does under those circumstances. Um, so I look forward to, uh, to exciting birding there. And more to the point, I look forward to the fact that the birds have this habitat uh, for them, uh, for, for their nesting, resting, and migrating. And again, uh, this is the classic sunset, uh, the end slide, except for this is only the beginning for Glade Run Lake. It's newly refilled, it's getting better all the time. Um, and it's a gem. And, I, and again, it's been my, my honor and pleasure to play a small part in helping, uh, helping to ensure the future of this lovely spot. Bob, thanks ever so much for that. And I hope you've inspired some people to come out and take a look at the birds that we have on the lake. Absolutely. So we've talked about the birds, we've talked about the fish, the habitat. Of course, Glade Run Lake wouldn't be what it is without the people who use it. And one of the ways we get to use it is through the trails and the groups that help us in building those trails. So Susie, do you want to say a bit about the trails and the work you've been doing with the Boy Scouts out there? I certainly will. So anyways, hey, I, I'm Susie Salter and I've been with um, Glade Run Lake Conservancy Board since I think November of 2011. Um, as a board, as a, as a board, we, in the, stages we were trying to find right ways to get people interested in in seeing the lake and, and you know and what we're missing so we decided that um, it would be a good idea to uh, put a trail in so we we got permission from um, fish and boat that we could uh, put a trail on the north shore of the um, of the lake um, a few of us board members we marked the trail and then spent a few days clearing it but we noticed that one drawback was is trying to get from across the stream uh which it's one of the tributary streams and you, you and you and we needed some way to get it so that's when the boy scouts really got involved um the local troop 58 it always used the uh those are some of our board members that helped uh helped in the initial uh getting the lake uh, the, the getting the trail cleared. Um, so one of our, so 58 always, Troop 58 always used the lake for their canoe school. And so they were really missing it. So one of the scouts, um, Adam Dare, decided to build a bridge across th this, the stream for his Eagle project. And he drew the plans up through, he had a, he had a CAD class in school. And, um, with the help of a few people from the Fish and Boat Commission and the Butler Conservation District, we were able to uh, apply for a GP7 in which you 
stream crossing permit in which you need to cross streams. I learned an awful lot about um, floodplains, uh, water delineation, erosion and sediment plans. But so anyways, Adam completed his bridge and I think you saw the picture of it on Becky's slide and you'll see it on my slide in, in a few minutes. Um, he happened to win, or not win, he was awarded the Butler County Conservation, Conservation District's Youth Award for his project. And that's really quite a, an accomplishment for that. What's up, Buttercup? So, I guess it was, um, but also we needed a way to, um, to get to, to preserve the wetlands on the trail. You know, we're, it's, a, it's a lake habitat, and so it's spring fed. A, a lot of it is spring fed. So um, some of the uh, Boy Scouts decided to, uh, we, to make wooden walkways, and we kind of liberally refer to them as bog bridges. Um, the first one that was built was back in the spring of uh, 2017, and it was, a, this is it, it was 150 foot. Um, uh, yeah, it was 150 foot long. And it really does serve, it's, it's beautiful now when you walk down because you can see how, how um, the, the, the parts around it are, are preserved in the, in the moisture and it's I get great for the reptiles and the frogs and, and whatnot. Um, so that was, yeah, that was in the fall of, that was in the spring of, seven, of 17. And then the fall of 17, another scout decided to extend the trail the whole way out to um, Sandy Hill Road. So all in all, since the time of the first one, there's been approximately 825 feet of bridging, and that was done by four different Eagle Scouts for their projects. Um, there's two more, two more ball bridging projects that were planned for this spring and summer. They're on hold right now because of uh, COVID-19, but um, as soon as they get the, the green light, they will, they will start that. Um, so as there, that's, that's Adams Bridge. As to date, um, there's, there's 19 finished Eagle projects, and they were from Troops 58, 417. Uh, there was an informative kiosk um, next that was, that was built by, by a scout and that's at the head of the that's the head of the trail, and it's great. It's great. It gives us a lot of information you can find there. Um, we've had uh, wood duck houses. You go next. Next. Uh, yeah, we've had um, wood duck um, houses um, put on the southern shore of the lake. Uh, we've had bat boxes along the trail, and also um, near the lake shore down by the jetty. Um, three scouts, I think Dave had, had told you about that, have done fish habitats, which great learning experience for them working uh, with Ben Page at Fish and it Boat. Um, there was the porcupine structures, I think the vertical structures and the, uh, the turtle basking um, uh, platforms. Um, let's see, we have two scouts have built benches around the lake. Um, and then if you've been at the lake, you've seen the concrete picnic table. That was an Eagle Scout project. Um, the, uh, on, on the island, we had the scout who put a uh, the osprey platform and he did native plantings around the, uh, around the island. Um, our last completed uh, scout project, Eagle Scout project, was uh, done by Be our own Becky Miller's son, Adrian. And he's installed a handicap accessible concrete pad and walkway up to the Rust Matchet uh, um, bench that is in the parking lot that overlooks the lake. Um, DC and our sort, we've had DC and our service foresters there, Dave Cole and Zach St. Laurent. They did a walkthrough for with us, and you know, uh, where I liked the variety of trees that we had, and they identified some of the invasive um, shrubs. Uh, Charles Beyer, uh, Senior Director of Conservation at the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy, uh, came out one evening and walked with us. Um, and he, he identified um, the good plants and the invasives and gave us advice on how to control them. He is a man with an amazing amount of, a, of knowledge. So anyways, we're, you know, main, maintaining the trail has really been a struggle for these past two years. 
uh, with, we've had historical rainfalls and it's quite wet. So the bog bridges are very, very uh, desirable and we can't, we're making a focus to get those done so that the trail is, is easy to walk for everybody who wants to even fish closer, like uh, up to the, up, up, up the stream a little, or the, the shore a little bit into bird up to some of the areas where you really can't see them down by the, by the jetty. Um, so anyways, like if anybody wants to help, uh, help us in maintenance, we'd be, be glad to give you a board. You can just give us a, um, a, uh, an email and I will get back to you if we do some trail days. So, um, I know I'm running out of time here. So, um, I just hope to see you walking on the trails. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, Susie. Uh, and to round off, we want to talk a little bit uh, about how to get in touch with us and how to know what's going on all the time at Glade Run. So Amy, can you tell us a little bit about the website? Uh, I'll share the website uh, with you in one second. I just got to find it. Yeah, sure. Take your time, Peter. Um, yeah, hi everybody. Um, my name is Amy Jewett, and I've been on uh, I've been with the the Glade Run Lake Conservancy as a board member now for a few years, and I have to give a shout out to Dave Fowler. Uh, he recruited me, and I am very happy that he did. I've definitely enjoyed my time with the board, and I really respect and value all the great work that uh, everyone has done before me. And so I'm really uh, privileged to be part of this group. Um, so the Glade Run Lake Conservancy uh, website is new. Um, I actually designed and built it a few years ago. And so mm -hmm. if you guys have not been on the website yet, I would definitely encourage you to check it out. GladeRunLakeConservancy.org is how you can reach us. And I don't want to take up too much time since I know we're um, getting close on our wrap up time of seven o'clock and I want to make sure we have enough time for people to ask their questions. So I'll be quick. Um, but some of the things that I would encourage you guys to check out, there's uh, a tab at the top called Experience. And if you click on that, it just gives a nice overview of all the things that you can do at the lake. Uh, and so in, in addition to um, fishing and boating, there's uh, bird watching, picnicking, um, just in general, just going and enjoying nature. Um, Bob Mulvihill gave a, a really great overview of all the beautiful birds uh, that we have at the lake and so I would encourage you guys to, to go and just take in all the beautiful nature that, that Glade Run Lake has to offer. Um, also if you go to our blog page, uh, this is actually a new part of our website. It features a lot of uh, just kind of new things that are happening. Um, Dave Fowler just did a really great blog post that talks about the habitat improvements that he talked about here uh, on the webinar this evening. So I would encourage you to, to check out our blog because we do try to update that uh, every few weeks or at least once a month. Uh, so that's frequently changing and being updated. Um, and also, Peter, if you click on the gallery, uh, so this also is being frequently updated um, as we get more uh, photos and videos. There's different categories of photos in here. So go ahead and click on Flora, Peter. Uh, and that um, there's a bunch of pictures in here that have all the um, different plant species um, of, uh, that have been found at the lake. Um, so there's just a bunch of different categories you can choose to look at. Some of the folks that are on the webinar tonight have actually contributed to some of the photos that you see on here. There's also videos that we have as well. So if you ever have any photos or videos that you would like to contribute and have be posted, on our gallery on our website please use the contact part of our website to reach out to us and let us know that's also just a great way to send us a message if you ever have any uh, questions or you just want to reach out to us uh, for whatever reason that's that's how you want to get a hold of us but as peter mentioned i do want to quickly just talk about uh, how to become a member so there's a membership tab at the top uh, right next to volunteering and donating and if you click on that there's options if you scroll down a little bit uh, to become a brand new member if you're not already a member. Uh, there's also options to uh, renew your membership if you're already a member. Our, our membership is uh, done on an annual basis uh, and typically it's from April to April. 
And so if you haven't already renewed your membership and you are a member already with the Glade Red Lake Conservancy, we would certainly encourage you to renew your membership. Uh, there's also the option to do a gift membership for someone else that you might be um, uh, like a friend or a family member that would um, appreciate something like that. And then finally, we have our Russ Matchett Society section. And this is for uh, members of our community that are uh, business owners that would like to donate $5,000 or more. Um, and we will feature them on our website as being, uh, you know, really, um, you know, donors that we certainly value and appreciate. Uh, and so that's our membership section. Uh, there also is a donate button at the, at the top. If you just want to give a one-time donation, that will take you directly to our PayPal account and you can donate that way as well. Uh, so with that, I'm going to wrap up my section on the website and we'll open it up to the Q&A part of our uh, webinar tonight. Um, so I would encourage anyone, if you have questions at this time that um, deals with anything that any of our presenters have talked about tonight, please utilize the chat feature. Uh, and Peter will, will kind of go through those one at a time and uh, the board members on the webinar will do our best to answer your questions. But uh, while, we're, um, while we're doing that and you have the opportunity to type in your questions, we do have a few questions that we had received already from someone. So I'm just going to go over those really quick and give you guys an opportunity to type in your own questions. So the first two questions actually are dealing with some of the rules and regulations of keeping boats at the lake. So Tim Schaefer, are you still on the webinar? I am on the line. Okay, great. Do you mind uh, talking a little bit about what are the rules for leaving kayaks at the lake and also what are the rules for registration of boats, both uh, motorized and non-motorized? Sure. So the first question I don't know the answer to, <laughs> um, uh, but I can find out for you um, about what the rules for leaving boats at the lake are. Rocco, would you happen to know that by chance? Tim, I do not, but uh, in experiencing other Fish Commission lakes, I don't think we do that other than um, renting slip spaces at uh, Wall and Paul Pack or Erie. Uh, so, it's, so, so what I'll, what, what, yeah, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll follow up um, with that question. Yeah, excuse me, this is Dave Fowler. Yep. And, um, yeah, she does. We do have a tie-up spot, and people can leave boats there up until the fall. Once the in November, I think it is, but they can find that on the signs that are immediately there, and on the Fish and Boat Commission website. But in Gladewin Lake, they can tie up. Uh, a kind a small boat and uh, leave it there. It's not in the water, it's on the land, but there is a, is a facility there to tie on to a cable. Thanks, Dave. Great, well, thank, thank, thanks, Dave. And, then, and as far as the um, registration um, goes, so if you're gonna use any Fish and Boat Commission launch um, statewide, whether it's a Glade Run Lake or elsewhere, you need to either have your boat um, registered, which um, uh, you can do for powered and non-powered boats, or what a lot of people do is have a launch permit. Um, and you can get to both of those. You could buy either of those through our website, which is fishandboat.com, or we have a really handy mobile app um, that we've developed that's become increasingly popular. It's Fish Boat PA. Um, so either go to fishandboat.com or fishboat PA and um, get started. Again, the launch, launch permits are really popular. I, I will say the benefit of registering your boat versus getting a launch permit, which is the same cost um, for an unpowered boat, is that we then have more documentation if your boat would ever be lost or stolen. Um, the launch permit does not include identifying information for the boat itself, but if you registered and something would happen, we at least have a little information to help you find it. So thanks for that question and um, uh, looking forward to seeing people on the water there. That's great. Amy, were there any more questions came in? There was, yeah, and Tim, thank you for, uh, for answering those questions. I'm sorry to put you on the spot about that, um, but thank you. Um, so there was a question, is fishing allowed on the dam? 
Uh, and the answer to that is that yes, fishing is allowed on the dam. However, fishing is not allowed on the spillway, which is right there along the dam. So I just wanted to clarify about that. Um, and also uh, there was a question and Dave Fowler did talk a little bit about this, about the trees. Uh, the willow trees that are uh, left in the lake and if that was part of the plan as far as once the lake was filled in should the trees have remained and and yes that is a good thing um uh, dave did a great job of explaining that they are a uh, great habitat for the fish and and they will eventually die off but in the meantime uh you know the the, the trees are serving a good purpose of helping the fish population to uh survive and to to thrive there um, and I got to say, Dave, 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 you're hired, by the way. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. better be careful. And then we did have one <laughs> other question uh, that was talking about the maintenance of the trails. And Susie did talk uh, a good bit about that. And so if there is any um, work that, that needs to be done, I know right now this year uh, we haven't had a lot of opportunity to get out. And so some of the trails might be a little bit muddy. Uh, but we do try to maintain the trails as much as possible. So if there are sections of trail that you see that really need a lot of maintenance, um, I would encourage you to contact us and just let us know. Uh, and if anyone ever has the time um, uh, and drive to help us to, to do that maintenance, we would certainly, uh, and I know Susie would agree with me, that we certainly would value any volunteers that would like to help out with us. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll hand things back to Peter, and we'll try to go through some of the questions that we're getting. Okay. Thanks, Amy. Peter, um, um, we've got a few questions in on the chat, and I'll try and deal with those, and then you can just shout out questions if you got. So the first question is about catch and release. Uh, and yes, it's catch and release for other than trout, and I think that's the way we're going to keep it moving forward. So you can keep your trout if they're a reasonable size, but everything else is catch and release. Yeah, and, and if I could um, answer, expand on that. So anytime we bring a lake back, um, we put the catch and release restrictions on the lake to allow the fish population uh, to build back up. Eventually those catch and release restrictions will be removed. And frankly, that will help to keep the lake in balance. Um, yeah. One thing that, that we do see happen, if a lake basically gets overcrowded with fish, it will stunt the growth and really sort of throw it off kilter. So catch and release now once the, once the populations build back up. And then uh, we do anticipate you'll be able to keep legal size fish. And to go uh, about night fishing, I've got a question about night fishing. Is that allowed? Night fishing is a lot. So I, the, it, whatever the hours of the park are um, I mean, to get into the facility, um, I believe they should be posted there at the uh, at the property. And I apologize for not being able to answer the specific questions. Um, I'm here in Harrisburg and don't know the details specific on the hours there. It's open uh, throughout the day and night. Uh, there's no camping, no fires there. Uh, and I just wanted to say something about the fish real briefly. We had the opportunity through Butler Tourism to have the Fishing University uh, do a fishing show of 30 minutes this past September. Uh, I, the show was incredibly good and it showed that they caught a largemouth bass of three pounds, three ounces, and they were so excited. They said they want to come back in two to three years when the fish are bigger and do another show. So it's getting a lot of notoriety throughout the country. Uh, it was on three outdoor channels, uh, and I could only access one, but that's their intent. So we're doing a heck of a job with the fish, and I think Dave's uh, uh, analogy of the tree with the birds and going down into the lake was beautiful because that's what we're building. So when people say, get these branches and things out of that, no, that's great habitat for fish, and that's where they caught most of their fish. Thanks, Siggy. That's Siggy, right. Siggy, not to interrupt you, but this is Rocco Ally. Hi, Rocco. Um, Ziggy, one of the reasons that three and a half pound bass came out, um, I was involved in the fish salvage at Somerset Lake, which ah. is another, another one of our dams being rebuilt. We brought a truckload, and I, I was personally with this truck. And I can guarantee you there are, bear, there are bass in that lake much bigger than three and a half pounds. Oh, good. Uh, yeah, there are. I good. saw them and I put them in. Good. That's I, great to know. Let me, thank the commission. This is, this is Dave Fowler. That. This is Dave Fowler. 
And let me second what Rocco just said. Okay. There's some big fish out there because we didn't mention that we've gotten some big fish out of other unfortunate lakes that got closed down. And yep. so the fishery, we need to keep working, but it's healthy. Yep. That's great. Thanks very much, Dave. Uh, one of the things, of course, that happens, some people ask a question about this, is unfortunately fishing line gets left lying around on the lake shore. And indeed, over the past few weeks, with the increased use of the lake, we're seeing more and more of this. A number of people have noted it. And yes, we will be going out and doing tidy up uh, sort of scavenging to try and remove that fishing uh, line, because of course it's terrible for birds. Um, another bird question that's come in, uh, have we ever considered building a bird blind uh, sort of along the trail beside the lake, uh, somewhere that people could uh, be able to have a sort of a quiet time to watch ducks and wading birds. Sounds let like me, that would be a good scout project. Let me, yeah, let me take that and Susie to, yeah. Um, what do you think, Susie? I think it's a great. I think that would be a wonderful idea to do that. Um, was this from, from David Brooks? Uh, yeah. I would love to meet you at the lake and go over it and you you are probably the the one who would be able to tell us where the best place to put it and some examples of it. We can even probably propose this for an Eagle Scout project. Um, I think it's a wonderful idea. Okay, thanks. Hey, Bob, here's a question for you. On our front page of the website, we've got a, a photograph of a heron nesting. Do you know which species it is? Yeah, it's a, it's a green heron. A green heron, okay, and it was, yeah. a, it was at Clade Run? Uh, yeah, it was taken at Clade Run. That was taken by Nancy Fowler, which is Dave's wife. Okay. Great, okay. Yeah, so we had, <clears throat> we had seen those nests and, and early on had wondered if, if any of them might be from the night heron, but um, of course there are a lot of green herons around the lake. I, I'll say that I've not seen anywhere as many green heron nests as I saw at Glade Run Lake. The density is just incredible. And, and again, you only have that density if the habitat will support that. Um, and so, yeah, the fish, the work you're doing with the fish seems to be absolutely very successful. That's what the birds are telling you. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and as those shrubs die back, that, that will uh, create you know more opportunities for for the birds through their through the effect that that has on enriching the lake uh, for macroinvertebrates. So anyway, thanks very much, Bob. Those are all the questions that people have uh, sort of put up on the chat board. I've unmuted everybody's mics, at least ones that I muted. Uh, if you'd like to just shout out a question, just check your your mic is unmuted and yell out, and we'll see what we can do to answer your questions. Peter, um, yep. Rocco Allen again. Um, I just wanted to compliment not only Ziggy, but uh, the whole board and the whole uh, conserv conservancy. Um, it has been really a pleasure to work with you guys. I really like the idea and really would like to see it done in other lakes. And that is the multi use area that you people, you people, because we didn't do it, you did. To make it a multi-use area for the public, you've done a fantastic job and I thank you. Well, thank you, Rocco. Thank I, you. I guess our philosophy is if, if people don't use it, if they don't come with their families, and if they don't love it, they're not gonna be invested in keeping it there. So this way we get a great resource for the uh, county, we got a great resource for the area. It's been a great partnership. So thanks Rocco, we all appreciate it. Thanks for bringing those fish in from Somerset. Yeah. <laughs> Keep them coming. All right guys, any questions from anybody? Uh, Peter, I just gotta make a comment. I gotta tell you, I haven't, I haven't gone to that lake since probably the eighties with my dad, growing yeah. up in Deer Lakes and what a phenomenal job you folks have done. I just signed up to be a member and that's great. Kudos That's to great. everybody. Kudos to everybody. It's beautiful. And yeah. now I got my teenagers, you know, with the COVID hitting the trails, hitting the bog, the bog trails, and 
it's a thing of beauty, man. Nice job. Great. Thank Bye. you very much. And I must admit, now that we've got uh, a branch of Chatham University up at Eden Hall, just 10 minutes away, I know we've got a group of students that, uh, in fact, they emailed me yesterday and said, can we borrow your boat? We want to get out on the lake and explore it. So that, that's just music to my ears. I love it. Peter, can I give a shout out? I see Reed Joyce joined us. Uh, Reed has been the person that's taken many aerial shots on his drone. He did a video for us of about 15 minutes when we opened it up. I want to tip my hat if I had one, but I'll give him the bald head back to him. <laughs> Thank him so much for everything that he did for has done for us and will continue to do, I'm sure. And Becky, thank you very much for your presentation. Sorry about losing you there. Sorry, it was uh, truncated. I had, I had a few more slides, but let me know if you're interested in conservation easements. All right. And guys, um, so Amy, Kristen Wilson is asking uh, if there's a way that Girl Scout troops could get involved, and if so, who should they contact? Um, can, you get, can you reach out to her and give her an email address? Um, yeah, I would say Susie's probably the good person to get in touch with. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You'll have Kristen's contact from the, uh, the setup of this meeting, yeah? Yep, absolutely. That's okay. great. Thanks very much. Thank you, Kristen. Our pleasure, Kristen. Uh, right. And David says we could use a film. Right. Anybody want to come and make some more films out there? That'd be great. Sure. All right, guys. A any more questions? Thanks to Tom McClure. I see that he said uh, thanks so much for your efforts. Right. Thanks, Tom. Okay, guys. Uh, we said we'd finish at seven, and it is exactly seven. And I just love timekeeping. Uh, <laughs> well, look, I, I thought this thing was going to go on for hours because I mean, all these people talking to me, but everybody's done a great job. Thanks to all the presenters. Thanks to everybody who's helped make this work, the fish and boat, the Boy Scouts, all the local landowners, Butler Tourism, uh, and particularly thanks to the people who come and use the lake. Uh, if you don't use the lake, if you don't use the parkland, it's of no value. Uh, use it, appreciate the nature that's there, and if you appreciate the life, come and join us, check out our website, uh, and help us make sure this is here for our kids. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Thanks very much. All right. Good night. Have a great weekend. Good night. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.